Funding for the production of Folks is provided in part by the Friends of LPB. One of the more historical marches to the state capitol took place in August 1967. It was the nine-day, 105-mile march from Bogalusa to Baton Rouge. Or if I had a number one wish for Louisiana anywhere else, it would be to get this economic climate out of the disarray it's in. And secondly, it would be that we can continue to move forward uh, for the posture of first-class citizenship in this state and all over the nation. Hello everyone, I'm Genevieve Stewart. And I'm Rob Hinton. Is the civil rights movement still alive? And if so, what role is the NAACP playing in the movement? We'll put these questions to Rupert Richardson, state president of the NAACP and a member of the group's national board of directors. That and more today on Folks. Everybody's just folks. The civil rights cause has produced a number of organizations whose roles have varied with historical forces of time and circumstance, particularly as they affect black people. Here in Louisiana, the civil rights movement has been very active. Over the years, we have seen many marches and rallies culminate on the front steps of the state capitol. One of the more historical marches to the state capitol took place in August 1967. It was the nine-day, 105-mile march from Bogalusa to Baton Rouge, organized by this man, A.Z. Young. At that time, Young was president of Bogalusa Civic and Voters League. It was a march for equal opportunities for blacks in the areas of employment, education, and housing, a march that then-Governor John McKithen doubted would ever materialize. McKithen said, quote, I found out that most of the stuff that comes out of Bogalusa is hot air, unquote. But the march did materialize with hundreds of black supporters. The marchers were not alone. There were also 1,500 National Guardsmen and 450 state troopers on hand. As the black march was breaking up, a second rally began forming, a rally of the Ku Klux Klan. In June 1980, the civil rights movement here in Louisiana made its way again to the front steps of the state capitol. The Legislative Black Caucus put together what was called the Survival Day Rally. It was a rally designed to attract Governor Dave Treen's attention to the need for remedial reading, youth employment, and improved health care in black communities. Some 700 demonstrators took part, including the late Emmett Douglas, state president of the NAACP at the time. Douglas took the opportunity to sharply criticize the governor. There is no communication with David Treen whatsoever with the black community of this state. After the rally, Treen met with black leaders and made these comments. I want to, to try to develop programs that will aid and assist all the people of our state, and not necessarily on race lines, and I'm not saying that you're suggesting that. On the basis of need, need should be the criteria on which we base our programs. The most recent statewide civil rights effort was the voter registration march last summer, a 250-mile trek from Shreveport to Baton Rouge a march jointly sponsored by the Legislative Black Caucus and the state NAACP. The purpose of the march was to dramatize the need for blacks to register to vote. So, Genevieve, it looks as though the civil rights movement is still very much alive here in Louisiana. You know, Rob, not only is the civil rights movement still alive, it's also been very visible here recently in Louisiana with visits by Benjamin Hooks of the NAACP and Jesse Jackson of Operation Push. Folks interviewed these gentlemen. We began by asking them if the civil rights movement is gaining momentum or losing momentum. It is gaining momentum. Uh, people are more aware of their rights, the lack of them, 
now than they've ever been before. The Reagan administration is, is characteristically um, uh, uncommitted to the enforcement of basic civil rights provisions. There has been uh, the lessening of a commitment by this administration. Uh, we had to go back to the streets again to get the Voting Rights Act extended. That never should have happened. Uh, our right to vote is, is non-negotiable. In many instances, the Voting Rights Act has not been adequately enforced. Uh, the, the Office of, um, of Civil Rights Commission has been impeded, as it were, by having a chairman who uh, constantly projects positions that are not in the best interest of those who have been locked out and rejected. I think we must now, however, have, have a new area of focus. We must, in some sense, expand our focus from, from aid to trade, um, from charity to parity, and from social generosity to economic reciprocity. A much greater focus on the private economy. After all, five of every six jobs are in the private economy. Virtually all of the wealth is in the private economy. There's an economic crisis because of a collapse in the private economy. The collapse in auto, steel, electronics, rubber, and textile, in part because of inferior management, in part because of over-dependency on foreign sources of energy, and new uh, competition in the world market. We virtually had a collapse in the private economy for these reasons. And I'm rather convinced that governmental or political leadership cannot salvage the private economy without uh, uh, a greater mindset uh, and a greater commitment to this nation in the private economy. You know, if you're going fast up on the escalators going down, uh, and that's what's happening to us, you have to judge the NAACP and its momentum in light of the national environment. And the environment today is hostile to civil rights, to human rights, and that always happens in days of economic recession. It happened in uh, Germany in the 30s, uh, when people became selfish, introverted because of economic crises. If you go anywhere in the world and study the history of revolutions and panics, uh, we'll discover that. So what we're doing is we're trying to go up on an escalator that's going down, and it's difficult to judge your momentum because they keep speeding up the down uh, trend of the escalator. Let me put it this way. Things are not going nearly as well as we had hoped they would in the decade of the 80s. Uh, we face hostility all over the nation in terms of civil rights. The Reagan administration has not only been, has, on, has not only, uh, not only has it not been friendly, it has been unfriendly. And uh, we've had people appointed to high positions uh, who didn't qualify at all in terms of their commitment to the job that they were holding. Although we interviewed these gentlemen separately, I thought it was quite interesting that both Hooks and Jackson questioned the sincerity of Reagan's black appointees. We have as our guest today Rupert Richardson, state president of the NAACP here in Louisiana, and also a member of that group's national board of directors. Rupert, welcome to folks. It's nice to be here. Let us begin by first asking you the same question we posed to Jesse Jackson and Ben Hooks. Uh, is the, uh, the civil rights movement here in Louisiana gaining or losing momentum? I wish I had heard their answers because I feel unequivocally that it is gaining momentum. As the problems become bigger, then the need to attack them also grows. And as a result of this, hard times, slack jobs, rampant discrimination, more and more the movement can and must respond to those needs. So that could only represent a gain in momentum. What about the NAACP? The association is certainly experiencing almost growing pains to the extent that sometimes for meetings we fail to allocate enough places, enough dinners, whatever. Without a doubt, that movement also is growing. I don't take that as any tribute to this particular administration. I take it as a tribute to the need of people to do something to help themselves. And the association is still the only statewide civil rights organization in Louisiana. Can you give us some indication in terms of numbers of uh, what the membership is like today? It's hard, you're talking about in state conference, it's hard to project a number, so what I can do is a kind of a ballpark range thing. We have 63 branches all over Louisiana, the smallest being in Cottonport, and that's about 71. You must have 50 members in order to maintain a charter. And then that range goes all the way to a New Orleans branch within excess of 10,000. So it's hard to say numerically, but in every parish except one, 
we do have, and that's Red River, we do have viable branches of at least 70 people. Along those same lines, and I'm not referring to card-carrying members, some people have questioned uh, a different type of participation on the part of the NAACP in terms of getting together attorneys, teachers, union members, leaders that will get together and have a meeting of the minds and do the type of brainstorming that they did in the 60s in terms of formulating policies and finding ways to Im implement uh, these strategies. Are you having that same type of meeting of the minds and that same type of energy and participation on that level that you had 20 years ago? Certainly not that kind of energy, but that kind of dialogue goes on. It has not spread, and perhaps it is unfortunate, to large meetings of groups, but leaders, we have a lot of coalescing with leaders of labor groups, business groups, professional groups, person in the street type groups, and we actually coalesce, however it is, mostly issue oriented around the food stamp cuts. There was the survival coalition and around some right to work legislation a while back. There was a labor black coalescing around some women's issues. We've had that kind. And we do really have coalitions at different levels going on at all times. What happened in the 60s, because recognition of the problems was so high, because our rights that we had found were so new, we found that we were meeting more in mass. All the membership of Louisiana Black Assembly and all the membership of NAACP and all the membership of Urban League. We are having now more leadership type conferences and they are open to membership. So it's not as if we tried to pre preclude any participation. I just don't think that 60s fervor is with us. We need it again and I feel pretty strongly like when it is really needed, I think it's going to be there because I feel a building process. You know, that whole 60s mood was a part of a real long struggle. I can remember in the association we had said, completely free by 53. Well, that didn't turn out to be right at all. So then we said, well, 63 still, still rhymes, you see. Completely free by 63. But at least in 63, we could see we were on the brink of at least that important piece of legislation, that Civil Rights Act. And so this is a momentum that had been going on for two decades. And unfortunately, when it came about, we felt that we had arrived at a place. And indeed, we had but at a place that without somebody goaltending and whatnot, we could erode from. And that's the feeling I don't think we have yet because of so many strides and because the people in the association, because we have a nice amount of our membership in the 30s at, at a minimum. So people can remember the back door and people can remember a so-called separate but equal when it was really more rampant than it is now because unfortunately we still have that. And so we feel like we've made some real gains and we'll just kind of mind the store. But nobody's just anxious to almost respond to a revolution. And indeed, it's still going on because it's a revolution of the minds. I want to see us get where you're talking about again because I think the need is going to be there. Do you think there, the black middle class has doubled within the last 15 year period? Do you think that there's a complacency and an apathy that has taken place and consequently? middle-class membership in the NAACP has been eroded? No, not membership, but active participation is not what we would like to see. What I find almost is just the opposite in the association of trying to reach out to persons other than the middle class because this organization is for all of us. People always say you surround yourselves with people like yourselves. And so I've been very cognizant of the fact that as a middle-class, middle-aged professional woman, I didn't want that to be our image. And so always our board is reaching out to persons from other Malu and or other, of course, economic status and whatnot, and also reaching up. I guess it's the black upper class, and of course that's such a small class. If it is anyone that eludes us in participation, that's where it is. And then I wonder if they forgot the bridge that crossed them over. But middle class, we're here. Can you give us some examples of how the NAACP is trying to get every segment of the black community involved in the organization? Well, we work through a committee structure. 
at the branch level and at the state level and uh, to a lesser degree at the national level because at the national these committees are made up largely of national board members state conference presidents other leadership at the state level our committees have to have some state wideness and it is here that we try to have our involvement it's the only place for involvement and so our committee chairpersons if you will look at the list while the great majority fall into this big middle class is not getting to be middle anymore it's getting to be the whole thing isn't it while the great majority of the chairpersons fall into that category simply because these are the ones that have come forward and say yes I will there's involvement in each committee with of people with a lesser educational status a lesser economic status and at the branch level I find it even more so you may have noticed that this has been an election year, 82 was, and so there have been installations going on. And as you follow those, look at the list of the persons who are on these boards. They are from all walks of life. We're trying. School desegregation is an issue that was addressed back in the 50s, an issue that we're still addressing here in 1983. And now the Justice Department is questioning busing uh, as a remedy to uh, you know, racial justice. What gains? Are we making gains or losing gains as far as the segregation efforts are around the state? Oh, around the state, I guess we're about status quo because you'll lose some ground on something and you'll gain on another front. And we are not seeing statewide a much better level of desegregation than we saw almost a decade ago. It is unfortunate, however, that people would try to negate the kinds of progress that we make because we're going to stand for nothing less than a fully desegregated educational system, just as we are going to stand for nothing less than a fully desegregated American society. And to even mention justice, that has gotten to be such a misnomer. I would recommend a kind of a constitutional mandate to change the name of that particular department because it does not represent justice. It represents maintaining now the status quo, maintaining segregation. An example of the New Orleans policeman's uh, situation is a classic example of justice, not standing for what is just and what is right at all. All told, we have made many gains. Educationally, I feel like the gains have been fewer and far between in the last decade than we would like to have seen. But there's no letting up. I think we are renewing now our dedication to that when you realize that education is the root of all the other things that we look at. Fair housing can come about, but you also have to have the educational background to get the job that it takes to buy the house. Open accommodations are fine, but if you don't have the money to spend the night at the Hilton, it makes a difference. So more and more we're horning in on trying to make the desegregation plans work. Many school systems have tried to develop alternate programs to reattract white students and maintain the white enrollment that they do have. And the gifted and talented program is considered to be one of these. Isn't really the gifted and talented program um, a means of maintaining segregation within the public school system since the students have to be screened and tested before that admitted? That is true. And not just that, but any of the so-called magnetized programs. On the surface they look good. You offer what kids want and they'll go regardless of color. But very often you have a system within a system that is segregated. By way of example, the Scotlandville Magnet School. And now we're talking about the large numbers of whites that are applying there. They're applying f solely for the magnetized portion of what that school has to offer. The mainstream of our schools must be integrated. The very same thing that you say is true about gifted programs. We are again, as you say, calling out almost it's not distasteful to whites to have their children with a certain caliber of black person. And that's unfortunate. Schools are supposed to mirror and reflect life and prepare you for that big model that's called life. And when we start to screen out too much, I'm afraid we lose that. Before we start talking about something else other than schools, I wanted to ask you one more question. I have heard many black people say that rather than to see their children bust, they would rather that the NAACP back off the whole issue of busing, and they would rather maintain sound neighborhood schools and almost have a separate but equal system. In other words, let me have my neighborhood school as long as the standards are maintained, and they would prefer the NAACP not to push the issue of busing. How do you feel about that? Oh, I don't doubt that there are some persons who feel that way, but we are dedicated to a certain 
level of life, a high quality of life for everybody. And even if our constituents do not understand, we have an obligation to do what is best in the final analysis for all the people of this country. As far as black people talking about neighborhood schools and whatnot, maybe it would not be anything wrong with the concept if the neighborhoods were equitable. But they are not. So when you say a neighborhood school, you're not talking about the same thing in Sherwood Forest that you're talking about in Estroma. And I think our people are going to have to be better educated. I've heard some of that, but I find those people to be very much in the minority. And most times when we can converse with them and help them to understand how this concept is self-defeating, they do back off. The bus has just been whipped until it's unfortunate. You know, the bus has very little to do with it. it the only thing it has to do with it is the means of getting folks to the schools. I have been in parts of this country where there's not a black person in sight, and yet you see the school buses lined up outside, and nobody complains about busing. And I remember in one instance I even asked, how many black students do you have? It's somewhere in Oregon, Washington, one, and they said, well, we had one last year. Well, who rides all these buses, you know? Everybody decides that busing is to achieve desegregation. A very small percentage of the busing that goes on in this country has anything to do with racial mix, and we need to put that issue also in perspective. Rupert, you recently attended the NAACP's annual meeting in New York, and it was said at that meeting that 1982 was probably one of the worst years for blacks in recent memory. And I'm, I'm sure many black leaders say President Reagan has done very little to promote uh, the civil rights gains for, for blacks. That's a mild <laughs> statement of it. <laughs> Do you, you agree with that? I wholeheartedly agree that not only has it been bad, but that we have made less progress as a people than we have in any period since the 64 Civil Rights Act was passed. And there have been many, many opportunities with the appointment of judges and heads of departments, and there is still just that tokenism. Yes, it's been a setback, and before anybody gets too smug about it, women have gotten very little during this administration, despite about 145 opportunities to appoint judges. Six have been women. One has been black. There's nothing else to say but that we have suffered a real setback under Mr. Reagan's administration. Do you think uh, uh, there's a lot being done at the state level to protect the civil rights of blacks? It has been surprisingly pleasant and very acceptable. And we are really always observing, of course, we are more vigilant on the state level than we would be on others, despite my representing many other states on the national board. But as far as that facet, of our civil rights. We are very pleased with appointments and that kind of thing. That, however, is only one facet of civil rights, and we still have some concerns on the state level and are very closely monitoring how the programmatic things go, how the block grants are administered, because we have to protect all of our civil rights, not simply who sits on boards and commissions and who sits in what office. Let me hasten to add, however, if you have a black department head in an office, the chances are better that you will get some consideration of your people and whatnot in the planning and implementation of that office than if you did not. Very rarely is the converse true. Someone else is just not as cognizant of your needs, even if they are empathetic and understanding. Most often they are neither. There's a big gubernatorial race this year. What role will the NAACP play in that election? Now, you know how Louisianans love politics, and <laughs> we've been waiting for 83 for a long time. <laughs> We're going to do everything to keep us legal, and I feel sure both gubernatorial candidates are going to watch to see that we are kept legal. And here's what we are anticipating. We will, first of all, have a meet the candidate one thing at our state conference, and the candidates for the major offices will come and peddle their wares. Okay, we'll ask them questions, we'll try to pick them apart, and send them on their way. Because that kind of a decision would not rest with the whole convention, but with the board as to who appeared uh, adversely to affect our needs, because that is the way legally we have to go. We do not endorse candidates, cannot endorse candidates, and I guess a big part of my job is going to be to keep us honest, not just at the state level, but our branches along that line. But we can and have an obligation to oppose candidates who are not in the best interest of black people. What is interesting about the gubernatorial race is that both have a track record. 
See, last time when it came down to the wire and we had uh, Mr. Lambert facing Mr. Train, Niza had a track record in the office for which they were running. So we had to do some kind of hypothetical quizzing and come up with some old things. This time we will do a report card. We will send each candidate for a statewide office a questionnaire. Based on that and their answers to the Meet the Candidate, we will do a report card and distribute this to our membership. And that report card will say what to do. We haven't endorsed anybody, but we have said who stood where on which issue. And I don't underestimate the voting black populace. We have it together. Can Rupert Richardson personally, separate and apart from the NACP, give Edwards or Train a great report right now? A great report? Mm -hmm. We have really not evaluated, and I feel like it would be a little fair, unfair at this point, considering Mr. Train's short tenure as compared to an eight-year stint for Mr. Edwards. Closer to the time when Mr. Train has almost a four-year thing in, I think it would be fairer. So uh, I not only could not as Rupert Richardson, but the association is ill-prepared because it would be such an unfair comparison. As state president of the NAACP, purportedly you imposed a gag order on the branch presidents. If this, is this true, and if so, why? Oh, I'm so glad that was asked because, no, that is not true and was blown out of proportion. What we have from the national on down is a standing order which says that branch presidents should not speak on statewide or national issues until they are very sure what they are saying reflects the national position. We had a very unfortunate incident, and I'm sure as media people you may remember, when a branch president in North Louisiana actually said that he supported the J. Bennett Johnston position as far as a busing limitation. That is against what we stand for at the national level, and so I did have to send him a mailgram. Uh, requesting a retraction. Because of that and two other similar incidents, what this administration did was to remind through a resolution that was passed by the state conference, not this president, remind them of our procedure, that you will not speak on a statewide issue until you have either heard from the state or the national. If it's pressing, just call these a place. If it's not pressing, ask for something in writing. We have to speak with one voice. And when someone says they're NAACP president, it does not matter how far off, the further they are from, are from the general position, the more the media like it. And the gentleman's retraction, incidentally, was never printed, despite the fact that he sent it to me and I disseminated it. I know it went to the press, but it had been all over the front page, all over the state when his position differed from That's ours. Great. We can't afford that. Rupert, our time is up for today. I'd like to thank our guest, Rupert Richardson, state president of the NAACP, for being with us today. Do you have any comments on today's show? If you do, please write us in care of folks in care of LPB, 626 North 4th Street, Baton Rouge, 70804. Next week, our program will focus on the political and economic power of minority women in Louisiana. Until then, so long. <laughs>